If you added up all the times you failed, all the times you came up short, would you try again? What if failure wasn't a limitation? What if taking risks was your status quo? What kind of world would you imagine? When the challenges we face seem overwhelming, we need to experiment with new thinking and try new things, create unlikely partnerships, and set audacious goals. To build a better world, to make a real difference, we have to take bigger risks, make bigger bets. And if we fail and fail again, we have to get right back up and dream even bigger. To live in a world worth living in, we have to let challenge inspire us. We have to take risks, be bold, and let urgency conquer fear. We have to be fearless. That's a great start. Thanks, right. Sally. So um, I know you're thrilled and I'm thrilled to be here on behalf of FAM. And we are here tonight to talk about what you described today at lunch when I heard you speak to the Economic Club as a mission book. Yeah. This is a book about wanting to change the world. Now, I know that back in 2012, in honor of the Foundation's 15th history, you launched this Be Fearless campaign. Why don't you tell us a little bit about that and, and what, what inspired you and what your goals are because of it? Sure. Well, good evening, everyone. I've really been looking forward to being here. Heard a lot about this place. Heard a lot about the kind of people that come to these talks. Thanks for making this part of your night. So we did do this research uh, in 2012 at the Case Foundation that my husband and I co-founded. But actually, the beginning of this goes a little further back. And I think we'll talk about some of that you know, my unique career has taken me from technology to the Case Foundation to my work with National Geographic. And as part of that, I've just had the unusual opportunity to go across the country to small communities, big cities, you name it, but more importantly, truly around the world. In some cases, to the most remote places on the planet. And the thing that really always struck me was no matter where I went, I found something in common. And that was people everywhere have great ideas about how to make the world a better place. Now, sometimes those ideas might be about their community, their neighborhood. Sometimes those ideas are truly world, you know, applied ideas. Um, and so, you know, we kind of grew a little frustrated around. So why is it when everybody has ideas, only some people actually dig deep, you know, build up the courage and take them forward? And we would talk to people about, Hmm, well, that's a great idea. What have you thought about you know, getting that started? And too often we would hear, mm, that can't be me. I don't really have what it takes, or you need this or that. And so this research that we undertook six years ago set out to look at the core qualities of innovators, change makers, and entrepreneurs, and ask where there had been breakthrough success or transformation, what was behind it. And what became very clear was the simple set of five principles that were present wherever transformational change took place. And this is true across sectors, this is true across geographies, and across time. But the most exciting thing about the research is that we were able to debunk the myth that so many people live with that it takes a special genius, or graduating from the right school, or coming from that place, or having this thing. And so, you know, we really felt that was just terrific news that we wanted to share with the world. Both the idea that it's actually ordinary people who do extraordinary things, and sort of a playbook around these five principles. So we've been out sharing them for the last six years. I teach a lot. Uh, you know, we work across sectors with corporations, with nonprofits, with schools, you name it. And as we'd share these principles, we'd see how they would really begin to transform both organizations and people. And so I think the idea that you know, came to us based on what many told us was, let's expand how many people get access to this thinking, to these principles, and thus was born the idea I would write a book to basically share them more broadly. So when I first started reading the book um, and Lonnie had reached out, I did it with a little bit of trepidation because I thought, be fearless. Like, oh my God, like, like she can be fearless, <laughs> right? You know, she's got a foundation and everything. And what I loved as I dug into it and saw it is how, you're not saying don't be afraid. 
Instead, you're saying, think about your fears in new ways. I wish you could elaborate on that, because I love the fact that you said, it's not that I'm not fearful. Oh, yeah. Most definitely, and I like to say right at the start of these conversations, you know, fearlessness is not the lack of fear, but rather the ability to look fear in the eye and push past it. And I'd love to sit here today and say, oh, yeah, I figured it out. It's all done. You know, no more fear. But this is not the case. I have fear all the time. But I think what I've grown good at is applying some of what our research taught us and what we see in these unbelievable, inspiring stories that I've put in the book, which I put in the book because they're stories that inspired me and our team. And we really felt they helped bring the principles to life. So yeah, right out of the start, we should say this is not about the lack of fear, but finding that discipline and that, that ability to look fear in the eye and push past it. I love one of the rules is let urgency conquer your fear. Um, what's one of your favorite stories or examples of how somebody let urgency conquer their fear? Sure. Well, some of you may have heard of um, celebrity chef Jose Andres, who is quite celebrated. He has restaurants all over the world. But Jose is an immigrant that came to America from Spain. And if you were hanging out with Jose, in fact, when he gave the commencement address at George Washington University, he opened it by saying, my name is Jose Andres, and I'm a cook. And that's how he sees himself. And the reason I provide that background on this urgency story is because some number of years ago, as he saw natural disasters occurring around the world, he came to realize that there wasn't really a good system in place for what we might call um, food support after a natural disaster. So he created something called World Central Kitchen. And you could say, OK, well, you know, he's a well-known chef. He did that. But actually, what he really did was the first chapter of the book is called Start Right Where You Are. He took the one thing he knew, which was how to cook and how to deliver meals. And when he saw the hurricane, uh, Hurricane Maria coming to Puerto Rico, he felt compelled to act urgently. So he went down there. He got a ton of volunteers, you know, some volunteer uh, kitchen-related things, and set up a kitchen. Uh, to prepare for a food response to Hurricane Maria. You may not know it, although it's a wonderful island, 90% of their food is actually imported. So there was quite a bit of awareness that they were going to be in big trouble on the food front. The first day, he sets up the kitchen and he serves a 1,000 meals. But he's blown away by the great need on the island. So he said, and you know, we were texting with him at the time, he's a dear friend, I'm going to double this every day if I can. And he doesn't, you know, he doesn't have a big, large organization. He doesn't have organizational sort of planning skills, et cetera. So he did that. And before he was done, he served 3.7 million meals to the people of Puerto Rico. And if he were here, he would tell you, I'm a chef. I did the one thing I knew how to do, and that's how to feed people. And really, one of the messages of the book, in fact, the very first chapter, you know, the first principle is make a big bet. You heard some of the principles referred to uh, in the video we showed. Um, but the first chapter of Make a Big Bet is start right where you are. And that's what Jose did, and to extraordinary outcome, really. What even strikes me is that he took a risk because it risks his reputation. To it say totally was. He was scared to death. And remember, he didn't even know what the situation was going to be with the hurricane itself. He didn't know if there'd be looting and violence and all kinds of things. But the thing that pushed him out of the comfort zone is what Martin Luther King called the fierce urgency of now. It gave him that extra boldness to push past his fear, push past his insecurities, and say, I'm going to do something about this now. And I tell several stories of people who've done truly extraordinary things, starting out with very little at all, who kind of embrace that same idea of, I've got a burning urgency and feeling inside of me, and I'm going to push out of my comfort zone. One of the stories, and it, may, it doesn't relate completely to fear, but I love the fact that you brought back the work of, um, and reminded us of the great work of Una Shriver. Yes. And the Special Olympics. Because when you, I was thinking back to imagine coming up with the idea of the Special Olympics and saying that you're going to bring this to a reality. So, right. so talk about sure. how that inspired you. Well, it's, we're here in Chicago, and you may know Special Olympics enjoys some uh, special history here in Chicago. But Eunice started Special Olympics in her backyard. The backstory there, as many of you may know, is she had a sister who had uh, intellectual disabilities. And of course, Eunice Shriver was a Kennedy before she married Sergeant Shriver. And you know, the Kennedy family always used sports, et cetera. And she saw growing up how 
when her sister would play sports, it was almost like a level playing field. The intellectual disabilities mattered less and it really became sort of a level. So she saw the empowerment that sports gave to people with intellectual disabilities. So she started what's called Camp Shriver in her backyard. And then, you know, she grew very committed and saw the overwhelming demand even locally uh, in Washington, D.C. at that time for people to play. So she came up with this idea of doing national games. And it was right here in Chicago in July of 1968, a very hot day, when she stood before a thousand athletes, all uh, with intellectual disabilities. And many consider that really the true founding of Special Olympics. And... Um, you know, there's a special oath that she led the athletes with, which is carried forward to this day. Um, and it basically says, let me win, but if I cannot win, you know, let me be noble in trying. Oh. And, you know, it's just a, it's a really cool thing. So, again, she took the one thing she knew, a sister with intellectual disabilities who had been empowered by sports, and, of course, she had unique access to a network. But if I can just go on with the story one more turn, I actually think the story of Loretta, who I talk about in the book, who is a very special athlete. Um, so she was born with extreme intellectual disabilities, uh, the daughter of a black mother on welfare. And the doctors told the mother, institutionalize her. She's not, you know, she won't be able to do anything in life. But her mother would have none of that and gave Loretta every opportunity you could imagine. So Loretta got engaged in Special Olympics early and it transformed her life. Then she became sort of a national ambassador for Special Olympics. She speaks four languages today. She has multiple black belts in martial arts. She holds some of the records for marathons. I think she's done 24 marathons in her lifetime. I've spoken after her. There was a Special Olympics gathering at the White House, and she spoke before me. And trust me, I didn't want to follow that. She was that great. She's spoken before Congress. A true example of someone who started right where she was, thank God for her mother who believed in her, and took what she had. And she's truly changed the world because of it. She's an unbelievable spokesperson for people with intellectual disabilities. Well, what I loved when I read that story was not just about her, but about her mother, because her mother was being thrilled. Correct. She was one of many children she was. that this welfare mother had. Correct. And I thought of how much your principles were embodying both the mother and the daughter. Yes, and the same is true in my life, as you know, Sally. So I was born uh, a little s south of here in Illinois in a town called Normal. Some of you may know it. And I was saying earlier today, in most audiences, when I say I was born in a town called Normal, people laugh because they don't actually think there can be a place. But here in Illinois, you may know Bloomington Normal. So I was born in this really small town with cornfield in my backyard. But I was the youngest of four kids being raised by a single mom. And I could see the fearlessness in my own mom and the opportunity that brought, that, that brought me. So yes, I think where we see a lot of fearless stories, we usually see a fearless champion of some kind behind the fearless person who encouraged them, told them they could you know, do whatever they set out to do. Not always, but often. I did. You'll have to read these stories about growing up. And part of it's just saying you grew up in normal, right? It's yes. A lot of play around the world. <laughs> but um, what I really loved was when you were re when we talked about it lunch today. You were working in the hotel that your grandparents owned in Bloomington, which is how you yes. gone to normal. You want to talk a bit, little bit about your early work experience sure. in the hotel? Sure. Sure. Well, um, Bloomington is the twin city to normal, and actually, my whole family hails from Chicago on both sides for generations. But in the 1950s, my grandparents bought a hotel in Bloomington and move the family down there. I was the only one in my family not born in Chicago because I was born down there. But you know, it was a working class family. My dad was a long haul trucker. My mom was a waitress. And so when my grandparents had this hotel, they were entrepreneurs. And it was really the first time I saw commerce and sort of business up close and live. And you know, my grandmother would often have us do chores, etc. But when she would let me sit behind the counter with her, she noticed suddenly the things that they sold, people were more inclined to buy things if I said, gee, do you want to buy anything? And so I think someone said today I was used as a shill. I don't think that was it. Was it. A candy but counter. it was a candy counter. But for me, it was a powerful moment because having been more in this working class environment, to see how business was conducted was a learning experience. And then later, when I was 11, my family, my mom moved us to South Florida. 
and I had a mentor who was, at that time, the mayor of the town. I thought I was going to be a lawyer, and my high school connected me with uh, the mayor's office so that I could intern in his law office. And for me, again, I'd been t I was on full scholarship at this private school, but I'd come back to my working class neighborhood by night, and it was the first time I'd seen people working in suits, you know, talking in a certain way that, frankly, I hadn't been exposed to before, et cetera. So I think that, you know, and what I like to remind people is, I don't know who you have in your life today, but it's quite remarkable. For me, I realize if they hadn't made a little bit of room to sort of show or to model for me this kind of life, things might have turned out very differently. But I, I give great credit to a number of people along the way who kind of did a hand up and modeled some things that, you know, as a kid with my background, I otherwise wouldn't have known. One of the things I loved about reading your story interweaved with the others was this whole idea of um, you know, you move, your, your family had moved from Chicago to normal. You, during your teenage years, moved from normal to Fort Lauderdale. It's a little different there. Than totally Australia. different world I landed in. I thought I was on Mars. And then you went at one point from Florida to Washington, D.C., uh -huh. where you worked on the Hill, yes. if I'm not mistaken. And then you later end up in GE, and eventually you end up in, you know, early on the team on AOL. And I was really struck by the fearlessness <laughs> and boldness. I mean, that wasn't a normal pattern for somebody growing up when you did. And so it strikes me that there was some sort of embracing change and being ready to take on the next adventure that may have inspired you on this mission for others. Yeah, I think so. Although, you know, one of the things I write about in the book is that I think too often success stories when they happen or when you get further down the line in life and you have a few successes stack up, we sanitize the stories. And that happens to me a lot. People will read this biography and it will sound so perfect, right? But particularly when, and you'll appreciate this, Sally, when I sit in front of university students, I teach a lot of MBA classes, you know, I'll read a failure resume because the fact of the matter is almost every one of those opportunities, you know, whether it is, uh, whether it was, I, I had an appointment, a political appointment from President Reagan that brought me to Washington, but it turns out they came in one day and said, yikes, we're going to have a gap of a month or two in the funding for this position. Can you just go chill? And it's like, go chill. I've got like a car payment and rent. I, well, you know, no, I can't go chill. If, if I have to go sit aside for a month or two, I have to go get another job. But that was the moment when I landed in technology. Down the street was the first ever in the nation, what we would call an internet company today. Back then we called them online services. And I never looked back. I mean, it created such a great career opportunity, but it really came out of a failure or a dark moment. Um, then ultimately, when I landed at GE and this, you know, startup down the road called, that was a risk-taking moment for me. Um, that, that was a really important one because you had a job at sort of the most respected company in the in correct the at that world, time, it's the most GE, valuable company in the world. And you're ready to walk away to a startup. Like, what did your mom say then? <laughs> Actually, my mom said, "Go for it, honey." But everybody else said I was crazy and they were shrill. But you know, maybe I should pause on that just a little bit because. I had gotten in, you know, once I got into this sort of internet business, and even when I sort of was working uh, in the policy arena, my real goal in life was to try to use whatever talents I had to empower others. I call that my true north. I knew that from a very young age. I would see when I was at this private school these wonderful families, great people, many of them high profile, high net worth, et cetera, who, you know, went to work every day and, and, and did great things, and then come home to my neighborhood and see just very similar qualities. Really smart people, really hardworking people. The difference in the two was opportunity. Mm -hmm. These folks had opportunity, many of these folks did not. So I knew from a very young age that there wasn't equal access to opportunity and I wanted to spend my career doing that. So when the startup called, I'm at GE, I'm on this good career trajectory. Um, it had, you know, there's a way you knew if you were tapped for their management training program that you were kind of on a trajectory. I was in my 20s. It was very exciting. Uh, and then the startup calls. But what I had learned about GE by the time the startup called was they were really comfortable in their number one in the world position. And they were a little less comfortable taking the kind of risks that I knew were going to be necessary to build a revolution, which is what we needed to do to bring the internet to the masses. 
Um, and I saw in this startup much more of a risk-taking kind of DNA. Um, and so I jumped. And of course, that startup would become AOL. At the peak of AOL's time, it was we carried 50% of the nation's internet traffic. And you know, just felt really great about the ability to help drive the internet revolution in America. What I love is though how you keep turning those experiences over. You decide to create the Case Foundation in 1997 and make this whole idea of empowering others really your life's mission. Correct. In these chapters. So at the Case Foundation, we like to say we invest in people and ideas that can change the world. So you might imagine we're always on the hunt for great ideas and great people uh, who are doing transformational things. So it wasn't as hard to write a book about really extraordinary stories, just given that I've spent truly the last 20 years just out looking and, and finding good things to fund and champion and take forward. But what's wonderful about it is you don't need to be, you know, we talk about your travel schedule of, of going around and doing these talks and meeting with different people. It's not like you need the money. Right? Yeah. And so well, let's talk about the mission of this book, right? And let's talk about how, you know, you're hoping that each time you touch an audience, what sort of, you know, what, what you might be able to be a catalyst for. Sure. Out well, in everybody's neighborhood. Oh, you okay there? I'm great. <laughs> so, um, yes, and just to be clear, uh, any proceeds from this book go to the Case Foundation, not to me personally, to fund more people and ideas that can change the world. Um, but, you know, the book was really written, I feel like we at the Case Foundation have been on a mission with this work for some number of years. If you don't know, in America today, startups, particularly new firms, are at a 30-year low. We should all be concerned about that because new firms are the economic engine of this nation and always have been. They bring all the net new jobs. In addition, we have daunting challenges in our communities and across our nation. We need all the ideas and all the players on the field. So the idea of the book is really a clarion call to anyone out there who has an idea about how to make the world a better place. That might be a company, that might be a movement, that might be a nonprofit, that might just be what you're already doing at the company where you are, the job that you have to expand the mission even further to have greater impact. That's really the point of the book. But I realized, I mean, as I said, just having this opportunity to be all over the world, you know, people need to understand the stories of success and that it is ordinary people who do extraordinary things. So I have, you know, a couple of chapters in there that are my faves, and one of them is Fail in the Footsteps of Giants, in which I make it very clear, this whole idea of, you know, sanitizing stories, that great success stories that you may know have a trail of failures that follow them. Oprah, of course, right here from Chicago, right? When she's first employed as a newscaster, she gets fired from that role. OK. But then what she told, you're just not right for television. <laughs> she has a major media empire today. J.K. Rowling, you know, rejected by a number of publishers. She was a single mom on welfare when she wrote the manuscript for Harry Potter. She put some of those rejection letters on Twitter so people could be encouraged if they're getting rejection letters and what they're doing to say, stay the course. You know, you will run into these things on your path. Keep going. One of the phrases, there are a few phrases in the book that just turn of phrases where I just sort of stopped. One of them was this idea, of what if instead of thinking about risk as scary, you thought about it like as your own personal research and development, your own personal R&D. And I thought, I, for me, that felt very freeing. I thought, this is something I want to share with my students. This is something I want to share with my kids. I'm not being frightened of it. I don't know that's risky, right? But instead, really think of it as your own test and learn. I thought that was fabulous. Well, I think that really is. I mean, what I, what I try to introduce in the book, really, are almost a little bit of brain hacks, if you will. Um, and this is a great example, because risk is scary to everyone and to every organization. It just is. I wish it wasn't, but it is. There might be a few exceptions to that, but broadly, risk is something everyone gets a little concerned about. And part of the reason is, you know, you think, oh, if, you know, am I going to bet the farm and everything fail? One of the other things I do early on in the book is say, any big idea or big bet, you can chunk it down to snackable bites, right? We know the role of R&D in technology, in medicine, right, and in science. And there, they're doing trial and error. And they would be the first to tell you 
that it is the error that actually teaches. It is the error that helps you refine something. So if you can do two things, if you can kind of get it down into small chunks, well, heck, if something goes wrong with a small chunk, it's not the end of the world, right? That's very R&D mindset oriented. And then, you know, the next principle is make failure matter. As you come across that failure, you know, you might have to spend a little time getting pretty down about it, but then come back, come back into the light, do the hard work of saying, what have I learned here, and how can this help me course correct and make even better the idea or the thing now that I'm trying to take forward. And the truth is, that is just how success, success stories and breakthroughs happen. Another chapter I have, um, you know, I talk about the need, and if we thought about instead of crash and burn, what if we said crash and learn? Because that's really what Make Failure Matter is all about. Failure teaches, and when we learn from it, it makes us better, and it makes our ideas better as well. You know, Thomas Edison said, I haven't failed. I've just found 10,000 things that won't work. It's a, great, it's a great spirit to embrace. And, you know, Einstein said, failure is success in progress. But we don't think about it that way. We can, it, we can be daunted by it and let it stop us in our tracks. The book really tries to make clear that many great success stories you know and don't know were lined with failures along the way. What I loved about it was this idea, you know, when your kids are little or they do something wrong or something and, and they say, I feel so guilty. And everybody said, you know, guilt and regret, if you wallow in them, really aren't productive emotions. That's right. The question always, what can you learn from it? And I love that you kept turning the frame that way. What do we learn from it? We're all going to have failures of any kind. That's right. What do we learn from it? What do we learn from right. it? We really turn it to productive rather than negative emotion. Right. And of course, in the risk taking, and it's kind of a, a marriage of a couple of principles together, in the risk taking section, um, you know, one of the other things I think I talk about is don't overanalyze and overdo act. There's a lot of brain science now that if we spend too much time overanalyzing or overthinking, we are not going to act. So finding that where you feel like you have enough now to get started, okay, getting started is the key, start right where you are, but not letting yourself get analysis paralysis. And, you know, so there's just a, a lot of sort of tips and tricks for how we get over some of the things that sometimes stop us in our tracks. I think another great example of that is, is you know, a lot of times, you know, learning to live in your comfort zone and maybe go a little out of it. And I loved your phrase, your courage zone. So instead of thinking going out of your comfort zone, that is going into your courage zone. So I'm going to borrow that one if it's that. Exactly. Absolutely. But Absolutely. I thought that was, again, a wonderful way of transforming it. And again, how do we use that in our interactions with other people? Because I think that's part of your gift to all of us, too, is the language to help coach the Thanks, people we Sally. love and know. Right? Thanks. Is that you've given us some watchwords. Well, I will also say them. it's not, you know, the gospel according to the Case Foundation. It is based on research, but also... I put a tremendous number of resources in the book of other books and places you can go online and articles that have appeared if you want to go deeper to learn even more, and particularly around this issue of risk where, you know, I try to put tips and techniques in to say, what is reckless risk? What is measured risk? And what is risk for you? Where are you on this risk tolerance level? Right. And most of us, as I said, are not very risk tolerant, but understanding where you land. And there are even exercises in one of the books I recommend so you can kind of get your arms around that if you're an organization or an individual. What's really great about that advice, too, and one of the reasons I was reflecting is I'll often work with student teams or even, um, you know, leadership teams out in organizations and they haven't done much innovation. They go, we want to become transformative. And I said, well, you're not going to become it right away. <laughs> yeah. you have to work it doesn't it happen do. overnight. You have to start with bite-sized chunks. Okay, this yes. is a change we want to make and be good at that kind of change management. That's right. And then you go to a bigger change and a bigger one. And what's really wonderful about this is that while you start with, it's not it's almost like not worth living unless you make a big bet, like unless you really bet on the things you care about. But there's a lot of wisdom in here on how to get ready to do that. That's right. And that, and that while it's true, make a big bet is a primary principle of being fearless. I also tell stories that started maybe not even possibly imagining how big the bet could be. Airbnb, for instance, you know, those guys started that business. They were, you know, a couple of uh, design students in San Francisco and they heard a design conference was coming to town. They were about ready to get evicted. They couldn't pay their rent because rent's so high in San Francisco and they thought, well, what can we do? Hey, can we rent out our floor? 
and they bought a couple of air mattresses and marketed to people coming to the design conference from their school where they had been. They sold the air mattresses for $80 a night, but here's the big thing, it included a hot breakfast. <laughs> and they sold out, they ended up having three air mattresses, and really it was, huh, if we could, you know, what if, what if we could think about hospitality as you go in people's homes instead of going into hotels? And I describe how person after person they talked to thought they were insane. Nobody's going to let perfect strangers come in and stay in your house. You're not going to let someone, you know. Um, strangers won't yeah. want to do that. They won't trust it. Well, Airbnb today is in like 190 countries around the world. Millions of people stay in an Airbnb every night. And it has truly upended how we look at hospitality. So, But I don't think that night that they put air mattresses are like, we're going to build Airbnb and have millions of people. It was sort of one step at a time with a bigger idea of changing out what hospitality looks like. Well, and it struck me even if you could take some of your rules and maybe go backwards a little bit. Like, let urgency conquer your fear, yes. right? Um, be ready to do a little bit of R&D, take yes. some risks, and then learn from your failures, right. right? And that's how you get ready to take bigger and bigger and bigger bets. Right. And the stories weave so beautifully at doing that. We're going to open up for questions in just a second. Um, while you guys are getting ready to think about the questions you want to ask Jean, um, let me ask one more. Um, and this will give you time because national, we've talked about the book, we've talked about inspiration, we've yes. talked about, I've made it clear there's a lot of great pedagogy here, right? Um, but what I didn't completely appreciate until I did even more research after lunch is the transformation that's gone on at National Geographic. And I would love while people are getting ready for um, their questions, if they understood exactly what has happened at National sure. Geographic in the last few years, love to talk about that. the risks that you and the team there have taken are just inspiring. Thank you. So for those of you that don't know, National Geographic turned 131 in January. We had 33 founders who came together to found National Geographic. And in those early days, the idea of the model was they would produce, they saw so much cool science and exploration going on, but felt like the world didn't know what was happening, right, 131 years ago. So they decided to create this journal, which is the National Geographic magazine, to tell the story of great science and exploration and bring to life what's happening in the world. Okay, they would make money from the magazine, throw it over the wall to fund more science and exploration. Fast forward the tape a decade or two, probably closer to a decade after the founding, and the editor comes in and says, hey, you know this new technology called photography? I think it could have great application for us. I'd like to put some pictures in the articles just to bring the articles to life a little bit. Well, the board about threw a fit. That photography thing is a fad. It's never going to last. No, you can't do that. It won't be serious science if we do that. Well, thankfully, cooler heads prevailed and the board passed it, but not until two board members resigned over the idea that photography was going to be put in the National Geographic magazine. Fast forward the tape. Last week, we were the first brand in the world to pass 100 million Instagram users. Isn't that cool? Yeah. Thank you. And then on top of that, going back to that photography thing, um, our documentary called Free Solo won an Oscar. So thank you, thank you. So we're pretty happy that the board took that risk 100 years ago. But we faced time after time where we feared our own disruption and that that disruption could be existential for us. That you know, if we didn't respond and almost disrupt ourselves, we wouldn't necessarily be able to stay relevant and perhaps just keep existing. So in cable television, we did a big partnership with Fox at the time to deliver the National Geographic channels, our joint venture partner. And then about three and a half years ago, we expanded that to include all of our commercial businesses, our travel, our digital, our magazine, everything. From that, the National Geographic Society got a $1.2 billion endowment, and about $100 million a year comes over the transom to fund more cool science, exploration, explorers, et cetera. Now, Disney is poised to buy Fox in the next week or two, and Disney will become our new partner at National Geographic. But look, risk-taking has been in the DNA of this organization, but we can suffer just like any organization that 
oh, you know, we have a reputation to protect here, that legacy thing that can happen. And, oh, we can't take that risk because what if we fail? We'll have let down 131 years of history. But I'm so grateful that we have a board that's willing to take the risks that are necessary. Well, in fact, history shows us most companies are, and, and organizations can't transform themselves like that. Most die. That's what history tells us. And so what I love about that story is that you're practicing what you've been learning from your own work at AOL and then through the case foundation. And it's just bearing fruit, you know, Very with much each so. group that you're touching. And yeah. So it says the principles are real. They work. They are. But again, I'm truly privileged to have this wonderful organization, again, with a history of risk taking that makes it a little easier to take new risks. But I will tell you that every month through our channels, through our magazine, through our digital footprint, we touch almost a billion people a month around the planet making us more relevant today than we've ever been in history. So it's, a, it's an exciting time at National Geographic. Oh, wonder, that, that in itself could be a lecture. I just hope that's all happened. So I hope you've been working on your questions. OK, great. Thank you so much, everybody. Great.